show on the road. My name is Stephen Plotkus Mercer. I am a principal software architect for LabVIEW R&D. This is my 18th year working on the product. Uh, at this point, I can almost be counted as senior, except that on my particular team, I still have Jeff Kay and Steve Rogers, so I'm still low man on the totem pole. Um, today, uh, I want to be talking about a uh, relatively new feature of LabVIEW, uh, Malleable BIs. How many of you saw Malleable BIs in LabVIEW 2017? Okay, so we'll do a little bit of uh, an intro on them. Don't worry, they're pretty straightforward, they're not hard to use. Uh, and then I'm going to get into what we've done with LabVIEW 2018. No, sorry. Then I'm going to get into what we did in LabVIEW 2017 SP1 to make them even cooler. And then, then we'll start talking about uh, what we've got in 2018. We don't usually release new features in 2017 SP1, but this was a kind of a feature that should have been there in the first place, but needed a couple bug fixes, so we got in. What are malleable BIs? Malleable BIs are a way to write a BI one time for one data type, and then call that same BI multiple times with different data types. So I can write a BI that takes an array of strings, and I can drop it on a diagram and wire it with an array of integers, and the wire doesn't break. Malleable BIs uh, can be analogous to C++ templates or C-sharp generics, for those of you who are familiar with them. We could have used the term template, but template BIs are already a thing in LabVIEW. We could have used the term generics, but we don't quite work the same way that C-sharp does, and with LabVIEW and XT coming along, and the interplay that we've got with, with uh, C-sharp there, it seemed bad to pollute the namespace. So we decided to call them malleable BIs. Malleable BIs, malleable metals, they kind of mold, you can shape them to fit their environment. Uh, and as I pointed out, uh, after release, so that it was too late for marketing to change the name, that means we now have malleable BIs to go with our ductile wires. <laughs> the uh, code that I'm gonna be working with today uh, is entirely the existing shipping BIs. Uh, I've tried to, as much as possible to say, look, if I can't demo from what's in the product, I probably haven't put enough in the product. So if you want to follow along on your laptop, uh, the LabVIEW directory, examples, malleable BIs is where you're going to be able to find all the stuff <coughs> that I'm looking at today. Uh, the, the goal of this is to not just show you a new feature, because um, that I can do, you can read the upgrade notes. Um, and there are shipping examples, you can walk through them. But I want to try and get to some of the philosophy of how to use them so that you can write them better. And that is something that I have found is very hard to convey in white papers and upgrade notes. Uh, and it works a lot better when you're around to ask questions. So if you need to interrupt to ask questions, feel free to do so. And with that, I'm going to flip over to LabVIEW. So, this is a malleable BI. This is a malleable BI that shipped in the pallets in LabVIEW 2017. Uh, it's called Sort2D Array, and it is functionality that many of you may have written. Um, it allows you to pass in an array and sort it. Sometimes we need to sort by columns, sometimes we need to sort by rows, so it allows you to pick which one. And then it's got an input for which column would you like to use to sort by. And traditionally, you would write this VI once, and you would be able to have that array of integers and use it. And then someone says, now sort me my 2D array of strings. So you do file save as, and you go through and you change all the integers everywhere to strings, and you figure out why it's broken, because you missed one. And then, now you've got two, and then you find a bug in the original, and you have to remember to fix both of them. And this has been a pain in LabVIEW's side for a long time. So now, with the, the new stuff, we can come in here and we can say, replace that, and what comes out the other side is now an array of strings. Because the little sub guy down here said, hey, I can do anything with any 2D array. I don't care about the subtype. Now if we open this up, it looks just like a VI. 
There's nothing particularly special. In fact, the only thing that really makes them special is that file extension. It's got a .bim. And other than that, it's a BI. Now, when you put the .bim file extension on, you also have to mark it as inline. That's a this, just, just a requirement. But it's a BI. What makes it special is LabVIEW sees that file extension and says, hey, I'm going to not treat that as a direct call to this BI. I'm going to treat that as a call to this off diagram compiled thing where we're going to take whatever code is in the BIM, and if you notice, it's written in terms of a variant in this particular case, and I'm going to rewrite it with whatever the type is that comes in. Now, some of you are probably thinking, oh, it's a cast of a variant. That's how he's doing it. Well, not really, because I could really actually change this into a numeric. The BI is unbroken, and so is the column. It doesn't care what the data type used on the inside is. The only rule about it is you have to give us at least one unbroken data type. So the VIM has to itself be unbroken. So you have to pick some type that your block diagram works for. And that's useful for several reasons. One, it proves to you that you've actually got working logic. Um, and two, uh, it, it means that we, you, we have some clue to your users how polymorphic is it. You give, you've given them a prototype, it, it's at least at least polymorphic to accept this type. So pick types <coughs> that are like it. If I had created that BI with integer, would it be easy to change it to two of the IS without having to start all Yes. Uh, literally, do file save as and change the file extension and mark it as inline. Okay. So if you have an existing BI and you want to make it as malleable as this, change the file extension. Heck, you can do it on disk if you don't want to do the file save as. And you can, and then mark it as an inline BI. That is what it takes. Um, if you want to make it not malleable, delete the M. Yes, yes. It, it does want to link against that specific name. So it is no different than if you had renamed the main part of the name. Um, There's some, and there's good reasons behind that. Um, I don't know if you've ever gotten into swapping a regular BI for a poly BI and some of the strangeness that can occur. I decided that that should be a little bit more of a perhaps conscious choice. Um, so this sort2d array, I picked this one because there's a lot of code here. Um, and maintaining all of this and making lots of copies of it is quite painful if you had to, if you had to keep this up to date. Um, because getting a highly efficient sort 2D array takes a lot of time. I, I put a lot of time into tuning this to get every drop of performance out of it that I can. Um, and yes, it fits on one monitor when I've got a single monitor at home. Um, That's not how that works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it can. Nobody ever said a spec size for monitors. Um, the point being uh, that these things, you, you can write them and you create and slowly create more usable utilities. Where are you going to use this? Uh, the first place we expect to see people using them is in your mathematics libraries. You've probably all written functions that have to handle all eight <coughs> integer data types, or singles and floats, or perhaps every floating point or fixed point number under the sun. You end up cloning, you build a poly BI so it can adapt to them all. We can eliminate all of that. The next place you start seeing it is handling your clusters, where you have the same, you have, a, you have a common cluster, and all of these clusters have an element in the third position, and you would like to just simply use the same sub BI to handle all of these different unrelated data types. Then you start getting into some of the class polymorphism, which we'll get to in a moment, um, and then we get to the exotic use cases. But those are that's where you kind of are going to start. Um, oh, and you, you'll also probably start with some of the array manipulations. That you've probably written a lot of array utilities, uh, manipulations. The ones we shipped in the pallets, there's now a shuffle 1D array. Uh, there's a, the sort 2D array. <coughs> These sorts of things that we've all built. And lab you could have built primitives for and all this. Now we can write the VI once and be done. So more of those are going to become library functions. <coughs> so. Let's step into these actual, uh, let's start with this one. 
So, what happened in Lambda 2017 SP1? F1. Um, when we shipped, this would have been a broken VI. When you write a malleable VI, we take whatever type you wire, and we go and we try to make it work through the block diagram of the sub VI. And in this particular block diagram, we have a class, let's say the cooling system one. We call the cooling system, and it calls this cool until target. And so that's a method of the cooling system class. And if we put any other class through, that's going to be a broken wire because it's not this. I mean, if you picked a child class, sure. But if you picked an unrelated class, it's going to break. Uh, there's no, if there's no relationship between the classes, then there was no type problem. Well, what we did in 2017 SP1 is we, we finished out a feature that I had really wanted to fit into the main release, but it just ran out of time, and made it so that the malleables were a little bit smarter. And now they say, the they put <coughs> unrelated type through there, when they see a cool until target, it's a method. They're like, let's see if this new class, does it have a method of the same name? Does that method have the same connector pane? Well, then let's swap it in. And that allows us to do something fun. So if we look at the class hierarchy here, it's completely flat. There's nobody inheriting from anything other than five view object up at the top. So we've got some generic sensors. We have over these. Uh, we've got the thermal sensor class. We've got the test class. We've got the cooling system. But then we've also got specifically an evaporative cooler and a J-type thermocouple and a compression cooler, all totally unrelated. Well, if we look at the block diagram on the collar, we see that we were able to wire the evaporative cooler and the J-type thermocouple to this run thermal test system. And what it did is it adapted each of those method calls because these two classes have the right method names matching the names of this. So we're able to write this BI once and then pick completely unrelated classes and get away from the requirement to have inheritance. Uh, many of you over the course of the last uh, couple days of sessions have talked about interfaces, the value of interfaces, how to get some separation in your code. This is not full true interfaces that I have want, been wanting to build for all these years. But it's a big step toward in that direction. And as we've heard in, if for anybody who stayed after Casey's presentation last night, we found a way to combine the malleables with the abstraction that he did and get some significant kick to the power. Um, that we'll talk about probably more at the CLA Summit in next year's in I would. Now, when you're debugging malleable VIs, you open it up and you're like, well, I gotta, I gotta fix this. But you can only see it in terms of the types it was written in. And if it's ever broken, sometimes you're like, I need to see it as it would be with the new type. So you can come in and say, convert instance VI to standard VI. And it says, are you sure? Because now you won't be connected to the malleable VI anymore. It's going to go build a real VI and pull the code in. And I say, yes, please convert that. And what it sub shows is the converted VI. And so now we can see the inputs are specifically the J-type thermocouple and the evaporative cooling system. And all of the methods along the way, these were the original methods in the commented out blocks. And in the other frame is the, is the method that was substituted in. So if I do a control U to expand that a bit, we can see that it got specifically the evaporative coolers cool until target. It got changed, swapped into this. Does this make sense to everyone? I mean, at the end of the day, this is a pretty simple pattern match. If the class wire ends up broken, ask if the, the new class has the same method name and the same connector pane, and if so, replace it so the wire is no longer broken. I mean, that's basically the code I had to get working. What do you do to get there? Do you change something in the... So, to see this particular yeah. diagram, all I did was I went to the, to the call site, and I said, convert the, the malleable VI that was here yeah. into uh, a real VI. So, and, and then if I want to go back, I can undo it. Now I'm back to calling the VIM. You can see the label change there. Um, that helps a lot with debugging these things. Uh, because when you're, when you're programming abstractly, and you try to put a new type through, and you think this should work, and the wire breaks, <coughs> it's often useful to go in and say, why is it broken? Does that convert just create a copy? 
uh, it creates a brand new untitled VI that your diagram is now linked against. Um, and in a sense, it's a copy, but it's a copy that has been modified for the for the wired types. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So Steve, does this interfect all my reference now? Explain that question. Yeah, so sorry. Uh, in effect, uh, I'm wondering if each of those sites could have been a call by the reference now. No, because it's still not like opening a reference. These are still these are regular you know sub BI calls. They're just they're they've just been swapped in as part of the comp compilation of the block diagram. Um, if, I, if I remove so um, these diagram disable structures are there merely for your convenience. I left them in because I found them really useful when I was debugging. What was the original node was here? What did it get swapped with? And I could have cleaned it up when creating these copies. And I was like. Look, if I found that useful for debugging, I figured the rest of you would. So um, when you convert over, it just marks them so you can see where the substitutions happen. Um, but they're just regular sub notes. And that's all it's all it's doing. So it's, there's not a call by reference involved. And there's no runtime dependency. It's a it's a static a static compile time choice. Right. It's a it's a static choice to make make the call to this function. Those methods that can be swapped in, they can be dynamic dispatch or static dispatch. So that's the new stuff in 2017 SP1. That's old. <laughs> but even being old, it's still got one cool thing. See, the compression cooler is a special class. It's got a sensor built right into it, and it's got the blower, and it's all packaged together, which means it's got the detect temperature function and the cool until target function which allows the same compression cooler to wire to both terminals. And now you have one class able to do two jobs for a VI that was originally written for two independent pieces. And we can start bringing these things together. And we can start making that ball into a nice, useful package. There's a lot of power behind that. I'm not going to go into it further today. There's a whole raft of conversation. I want to get to something else. I won't say cooler, because this is a cooler. <laughs> but um, I encourage you guys to play with these and, and find new innovative ways to use them. What I want to talk about next is the new piece of 2018. So it's been a few years since I've had a new structure node. Uh, but today, we get a new structure node. So if we look at this VI, I'm going to hide a bunch of comments, because you don't need to be reading those. Uh, right now, so I'm going to tell you basically what it says. This is in the palette, the increment element or node. And it takes in an array, and you say increment this position, and it increments that position in the node. It's a little helpful function. It's not particularly special functionality. It's nice to have. Um, the second one, though, is the same node wired with an array. So it will say increment all of these indices. That's nice. Well, we've made one node do both jobs. And if we open up the block diagram here, what we see is that increment array element has this structure node. Ooh. It's a lot of fun adding a new structure node to lab group. Um, it's an opportunity to refactor a lot of things, because some of the older parts of LabVIEW are still around. You get to see how the code used to be done, and then you get to delete it. Um, there's uh, and, and, and the structure node uh, code is some of the some of the foundation layers of LabVIEW. So this was, this was a fun experience for me. Uh, I've never had, you know, I've never gotten to, to play with that part. The type specialization structure, uh, when when Jeff Jeff first proposed it and laid it out, is pretty simple. You write frames of code, like a, like a case structure, or more like a diagram disable structure, and it picks the first frame that works. It's really odd, but if you look at the other frame, it's got a broken wire. Um, and you notice it says ignored. Well, that's because when, when the code looked at this, at this diagram, it said, hey, this is an unbroken diagram, so I'm going to accept this frame. And everything after that, I'm not even evaluating. It's ignored. It's whatever it is. I'm a, I found one to accept. Well, let's, let's take a look at what happens when we convert this one. Convert instance VI to standard VI. Yes, please. Well, here, 
the zeroth frame says decline. And that decline frame means we're going to go through and pick the next frame. And the next frame it says, oh, that's accepted because it doesn't find any syntax errors. So what we were able to do, if you, look, if you compare the functionality of the two, the first one assumes that we can just, that this must be a, 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 a scalar number that we can use as an index. The other frame is some special customization code that we can use to get an array. We write both, and it picks the first one that works. So when we run a new type through, it will take the first one that works. Why did you wire to the end? The, uh, the array size? Yeah. Well, let's think about that. So, what does this code look like if I run a scalar through here? In other words, if I replace this, The numeric, whoops, not that one. Right, this one. If I replace this with a scalar, this is what breaks. But without this one, you get unbroken code. This, it, it tries to treat that as a scalar value, and things were not were not necessarily happy. It was allowing things through that I didn't want it. I didn't want it picking this case. So I used a node that was explicitly only valid <laughs> for an array. And this is where malleable PIs get really weird. I'm just going to flat out say it. <laughs> I have written some very bizarre code in the last couple of months, uh, particularly getting ready for this presentation, because you are writing broken PIs. <laughs> and you can't use the control B key because that's good code. Luckily, it's grayed out, so control B doesn't delete anything. But you're writing it, you're like, uh, is that is that a good broken wire or a bad broken wire? <laughs> and you laugh, but we're gonna. When I when I was like playing with this, I'm like Jeff, this is this is odd, and he's like, yeah, but it's useful. <laughs> it's just kind of Jeff's attitude on this sort of stuff. Um, and and when Rob 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 Dye is one of the other guys on our team, he's like, this is kind of strange, and Jeff's like, yeah, but it's useful. So you're all going to say this is weird, but it's useful. <laughs> and so yeah, you find yourself doing little things like wiring the end terminal in order to guarantee that this is an array. Um, and, and doing odd cheats like, so it would actually work the same if I did this. I don't actually have to wire that in. I just need a node that is going to break. <laughs> and so you'll find code in my stuff that doesn't do anything. And the compiler says, hey, that output isn't wired, so I don't need to generate that node. So it's not even going to bother to do it. And it just dead code eliminates. Um, and so there's, there's a number of places where you'll see that just kind of hanging out there. Why is it here? Think about what it would be without it. Uh, it should be a broken run arrow saying, I don't know how many times to iterate through this loop. Yeah. It's in there. Oh, and you can get you got some weird things with 2D arrays coming through where you, you couldn't get that. The 2D array was important because then it would get an array going in the end terminal. So yeah, there's I'm not totally insane when I write this code. Um, it, and, and, and that's the other thing, is sometimes it's very hard for people to, to check it and be sure that you've actually written good code because some things and I probably should have put a, more of an explicit comment about why that was there. Um, because when you write odd code that you, you feel you're, the need to justify, you probably should justify it in writing. Um, yeah? No. No. So it's, it, this is compile time. So this, this the client frame is diagram disabled out. It's not even there at compile time. Well, sure. But because it slowed down my edit time, it gave the ID. Not. In any notion, well, it's, it's adding another frame to a case structure to slow you down. I mean, it's it's really that level. Okay. So, um, so this is a, a useful structure. Um, yes, Steve. Um, I usually uh, for a subdirect man, I will set unbroken for. 
I'm broken for this time. Yeah, and you'll see that actually is a, is a convention I picked up later. Um, so some of the earlier pieces that I wrote, and I didn't go back and necessarily add that, you'll actually see that in uh, some of these others. Can you repeat that? Uh, he, he said that you can frequently leave comments in the, uh, di in the, in the text specialization structure. The subdiagram label, it's often useful to cite unbroken for, and then a type name, like unbroken for strings, oh, unbroken for 2D arrays. Uh, whatever type it is that you think this is going to work for. Uh, and then you can, that makes it easier for later code reviewers to evaluate. Now in the, in, in the increment one, the text specialization structure was around the entire block of code. In the sort 2D array, it's only over here at the side. See it hiding over here? In, and here you can see I use the unbroken for 1D arrays. Um, so this one is unbroken here, this one's unbroken for scalars. All I was trying to do in this case was to get the, the scalar, I needed it to go through a build array case, and you can see my dead code up here, which is my trick for making sure that only scalar values, in fact scalar numeric values, are the only things that get through. Um, and then this one is declined for 1D arrays. Um, or is accepted for 1D arrays. This, all we had to do is get the two types to look the same, and then all the code downstream behaves identically. So you can use it for <coughs> entire algorithm substitutions when you know, your array of complex and your array of real have totally different mathematics algorithms, and you can use it for a little small patch in order to make two types look the same. Any questions on the structure? Oh, not on the structure. Not on the structure? So, Oh, did you notice that? <laughs> um, so he noticed that the if, if you open up this VI in Live in 2017, you will see it was already using this structure node, and it had a giant disclaimer comment that said, "Warning: unreleased, unstable. Be careful. Do not use." Uh, and we were okay putting it in VI Live code because we had completely vetted it out for this specific use case and for this specific VI, but we weren't sure how stable it was. And specifically, it was unstable when you started nesting malleable VIs. It didn't, it didn't behave correctly. Um, and so we didn't want it in general usage. We, we weren't sure about the API. It did get some stability fixes, so if it, if we didn't change its fundamental functionality between 2017 and 2018. Um, what you will find is that since Levy 2014, we have tended to hide new function, new features, one version early, somewhere in the product, like they're fairly hard to find unless you're told about them, and in order to be able to get testing from the, from the field, to make sure they're stable, to get feedback on them in a way that's a little bit broader than a, than a beta. When we think they're done, and we're pretty confident in them, but we can then you know, have a more, a better conversation about it, and then release it, the next version out. And we've done that for a lot of features since 2014, in, including this one. So yes, it was hiding in there, but if it was working for you in 2014, nothing has changed to prevent that in 2018. But in 2017, you would have encountered a number of problems if you tried to nest malleable VIs inside these structures, and they just weren't computing quite correctly, and now they do, so. Along those lines, so like I use that frame on uh, Active Framework uh, deployed to the C Rio and basically immediately broke everything. And so I replaced with you know the specific instance and then everything worked. You, are you aware of any further testing on Linux real time? Um, so it, it behaves the same on, on real time and on MPGA. All it is because the because the semantic rule <coughs> is very straightforward. It accepts the first frame that is unbroken. Um, Oh, right, but in this instance, the application built, deployed, but then load broke. Right, right, and so that gets that gets a little bit more tricky. Um, it's kind of an abuse of the node to use it for that, um, and I've tried to do so as long as you're using source VIs and such, uh, or you're building for targets where you're going to be able to deploy to a place with a compiler, it works fine. So for source distros, if you try to turn around and try and, and do it cross-target compilation. Uh, it gets a little more dicey. It really wasn't what it was in necessarily intended as. Um, I think I think we may be able to provide some extensions. It's doing exactly what it's correctly doing. It's not like it's a bug or anything to be fixed. Um, 
but it requires a little bit more hand holding to, to make it work right sometimes. Um, are there any plans to potentially extend the structure to allow us to explicitly define on a per case basis that perhaps a, cer a certain tunnel needs to be of type of ray? Um, so you don't uh, have these kind of oddball pieces of code that break. We debated that extensively. In fact, we debated that for the last, about the last three years. So his question is, <laughs> are we going to have any way of saying on a structure, this particular frame should be an array, and if it just explicitly declare it instead of attaching code to force it? And what it kept coming back to is essentially the need to create a type calculus. And every time we turned around and said, well, what does that calculus do? It was, well, a node that explicitly accepts only this type. And ultimately, the current position of the, of the team is walking down that road is actually not really something we want to do. Um, we think that, the, that it is better to use nodes that people recognize and to use the existing functionality to pare down to a specific type. Um, because most of the time, you don't have to write any specialized code. Most of the time, you just you write the code and it only accepts the one type that is going to survive. Um, and it's because that is such the majority case, and these other cases can be handled nicely with existing nodes, we've kind of come to the conclusion that we're not going to build any sort of type calculus. The one node that we built, we'll, we're, we're kind of going to get to here with the, the, type, the type match start, uh, node, but it's not, it's not something we hope we have to do. Now, if in the course of time everybody comes back and says, look, we are completely stymied and we can't get out of this box, um, we'll, we'll start building that sort of thing. But our current position is no. Does that make sense? All right. So if we if you if you try to put the kind type calculus in, well actually let me just keep going here, I'll show you. Um, uh, this is not a good one to show that with. Let me think. Do I have it on? I think I've got it down here one Alright. Um, so this this is a VI that is not in the palettes. Um, but you may have wanted to use it. It's in VI Live specifically the, the example points over to the thing. I just it's not in the palettes. It's a very useful debug VI. And I found it so useful, I decided to hide it in utility like Darren Ettinger and I have done for years. Um, so if you ever go look in the VI Live slash utilities directory, you find all the things that we thought should be there but aren't in the ballots. Um, this is a new primitive in 2018. The assert structural type match. It existed in 2017, but it had a different name. Um, if you use it in 2017, if you upgrade, it'll just rename itself as it upgrades. Um, the assert structural type match node says, I'm going to break, break if the two types wired to me don't match. Uh, and match means they have to have the same structural behavior. So ignore the names of wires, ignore the names of cluster elements, and ignore type depths. Is the general structure array of cluster, of array of, you know, of, of integer, of 32 bit. If that is the same between the two, then it will pass. Uh, and if it's not, then it will break. It includes cluster element order. So yeah, they have to be structurally the same thing. Um, in this particular case, this frame will break for anything that isn't a string. So this is my debug logger. And it takes any LabVIEW data type, and it really, as far as I know, it handles all of them, and will make them into a string in order to write into a log file. And for strings, I don't have anything to do. I just want to wire it across. But if all I did was wire it across, every type in LabVIEW would pick this frame. And that would be the frame that they would go with. But the only thing that should ever just straight up go across is a string. So I use the assert structural type match node to force the case, to, the, to force the disable structure. If you get any type otherwise, decline this frame. Does that make sense? Sure. All right. Literally, it's just a type equals. Could you use like a string link or something? I could have used string links. Um, and that would have made a less good demo. <laughs> <laughs> but it exactly highlights the nature of the problem. Um, we face a quandary here where if I use string length, 
Would string wings work on a picture string? Yes, it does. Um, or, yes, it could. You don't know, but it might. And, it, and even if it didn't, we might enable it to do so in the future. So we have to decide, am I writing this for, I want any type that LabVIEW has made pass through here successfully, able to pass through here, and therefore is future-proofed against new data types that we invent and things that we make modify. Like writing in a future version, which may be 2019, but marketing keeps promising will be 2019, uh, we're adding a couple of new data types, and we're writing them specifically in a form that they will be malleable with, uh, with arrays. But, and so if you want explicitly to get an array through, you would use the type, you know, the types of the structure match. If you want any future type that we enable that kind of looks like an array, you would just write in terms of array primitives. So, a little column A, a little column B, and you kind of have to make your decision on what your API is supposed to look like. And in this particular case, I know there's no other type I ever really want to actually just go through here other than something that is already a string to display. So, so if I have one of these and I've made my malleable BI for all the types that are in 2018, and in 2019 you introduce a new type, mm -hmm. then I don't have anything that will match. So that one might not work, except in this particular case, I have a base case that works for everything else. So you might be able, you might find something that works for anything else. In this particular case, I use the uh, XML node, and I say anything that's not here, format as XML and dump out the string. Okay, but 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 assuming I haven't been that clever, right? Uh, then this EI will be great. And, and I, when I try to use it with my when you try to use it with the new and type, and I'll just look at it and say, oh, I need to add a new one. Correct. So this one declines on strings. This one only allows pass through. So this one I didn't use the types must match. I said, look, if it's a path or anything in the future that looks like a path, that's good enough to go through the path to string node. Um, an array of strings, similarly, I can play some games there. Um, I want that. Then we start getting into these things. So if we look at the palettes and come into the comparison palette, I know, Darren says never look at the palettes. You should all do this with quick cross. <laughs> but since you don't know what's new, we got to look at the palettes. This will be the only time you ever look at the palette because from now on you're going to use quick drop, right? Okay. I have to, I'm, I'm legally obligated by Darren to make sure. Um, the new palette has the type specialization structure. It's also in the structure palette. And it has all of these asserts. I don't know that this is every assert you will ever need, but it's every assert that we have found any reason to even conceive of at the moment. Like, we've been building a lot of test cases and getting people to, you know, looking at what people have built as poly BIs and all sorts of things. <coughs> we've tried to make it so you'll never need the actual assert structure primitive. You should, most of the time, be able to use one of these. And these are mostly about mathematics. So, like, this one asserts any of the complexes. And this one asserts the real numerics or a real waveform. Things like that. Um, and most of them are, in fact, all of these bottom ones are all about math. Up here, we have an assert air cluster type. That turned out to be a, a useful one on a somewhat regular basis. Um, assert the array dimension has a particular count. Um, and assert dimension sizes if you're working with fixed size arrays on FPGA. Um, if you need to write a custom assert, you can look at how these are written and uh, follow the pattern that's in there. Um, what is this? Uh, assert variant. Assert variant? Yeah. You can do that one though with just the, the, the primitive. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so anything that could just be done with just in direct equivalence, we didn't, we didn't change. Um, so, uh, yeah, sorry, I didn't close this. Yeah. So this one is asserting any floating point numeric can come through here and get formatted correctly. Because if I didn't do that, my integers would all go into this, to, to, the to the floating point. And I actually wanted my new, my, my, uh, my, my, integers to format slightly differently. So I picked a different formatting. Um, Question? Yes. What does assert mean? Assert, uh, it means simply that the BI is broken if it doesn't meet this condition. Um, so if you uh, assert that the structural types must match and they don't match, the BI is broken. It's not, it's not a runtime assert, it's simply this has to be true. And if, not, and if it's not true, we are broken. 
Is there one for any type of enu, or do you have to specify the different types of enu? We do not have one for any type of enu specifically. And I'm, I'm not sure how you would do it. That one we might, if you've got a use case for that, we might have to roll one. All right. Uh, maybe. Uh, but not quite not allowed just a regular N16 server. He's saying make sure it is an email. All right. So now let's look at the stuff that I think is really cool. So we are not, I knew this going into this, so don't, don't be sad that we're not going to have enough time to really look at this shipping example. But that's why I made sure it was a shipping example so you can look at it later. But I want to at least get this all started. The BIs that are in here, I hope to put in the palette in a future version of LabVIEW. I hope that our future version is the next one, but I wanted you guys to see it and maybe even start using them now. Um, if, so, when you're writing malleable BIs and you start nesting, you start writing them for more complex data types, one rule that I kind of want to get in front of you and put in your head is, However many levels I have of my data structure that I'm making decisions about, I should have that many levels of nested VIMs. So let's, let's look at a bad example. This is the Shuffle 1D right now. And it's a shipping node. And it shuffles a 1D array, puts it into a random sort order. Great. We can put any 1D array. Well, let's say that we wanted to write something that was shuffle bytes, where it's going to take the, the characters of the string and shuffle it around. We're like, that really should be able to use all the code in the shuffle 1D array. You know, let's, let's borrow the algorithm. So the wrong way to do it is we have a text socialization structure here, and it's going to do one thing for U32 integers, where it breaks it down into the bytes, and then it does something different for paths, where it translates it into a string and then makes that into an array, and it does something different for strings, where it just does string divide array. And then it has the code for a shuffle 1D array. And then it has a, the structure node on the other side to undo all of that. Well, this doesn't work. Because the type here on this side is always going to be that array of bytes. And so it will always pick this frame. And so no matter what type you put in over here, you'll get a string out. If you ever have two type specialization structures on the same block diagram, you probably have a bug. I am, I am asserting that. I have found zero cases where that is untrue so far. And I have some actual like research reasons why I'm pretty confident if you ever find yourself writing that code, you've probably got a bug somewhere, even if you make it work. Huh? Because I couldn't be certain, and for what, because watch this. <laughs> this actually does work, but your bug is that it's inefficient code. So should I break it just because it's not necessarily efficient? It might be the only way you know to write your code. So I was like, and, we were, and, and Jeff was like, we don't know if it's useful. So don't tell them they can't do it. That's bad. So it's more of a code smell. Um, in this particular case, we have the translation, and then we call the shuffle1d array. So that's, a, that's better. We're just now we're using code. Should have done that in the first version. And then over here, we're using whatever it is that we use to break over here, we're using it to force the, the frame to pick. So we, we fork the original type around. And in the, uh, the string case, we use string length, and we say, oh, man, that's only going to get picked for a string. So even though they're all getting the same type. The problem here is not only are we having to write all this code, we have to keep these in parallel. Uh, so you, you're, you're much more buggy. You've got, you've got things that you might not get exactly lined up right, but it works. And there might be, hypothetically, some use case for this. So we decided, okay, we're not going to break it. We'll let it go. The right way, the one, the, the one that, was, that, that works better, is we say, look, we're trying to do something at the array level, and we're trying, and we've got we've got a, a, a scalar level where we're translating, 
and we've got something at a deeper level that we're manipulating the data. So let's use the fact that we're, we're, we've got a common sub-VI and use the common sub-VI. And we'll just translate around each of the types. So the code is minimal. It's exactly the code we had in all three cases. But we've organized it so that there is one structure that chooses, OK, in one frame, I will choose both the, the decomposition and the recomposition function. And select that on through. So that the integer has the decomposition and the recomposition. Uh, well, why not instead just have it convert to a byte array and then call itself at the end so that it goes into the correct case for arrays and then it can back out? There are several variations you can do on this. Uh, I was kind of trying to highlight the way to bring these pieces together as a more general thing. There are there are several different structures for it. Oh, call it recursing on the VIM. Sorry, I missed that. No, VIMs you cannot recurse on. Um, they don't. They they inline their code, and they don't know how to to un, un, unroll that. Um, there's discussion about how we might enable that because there are definitely some very valuable use cases down that road. We don't have that at the moment. Yes? So this, what you just showed is fine if you have one VI as the, the main chunk of the code, but if you have something much more complicated, you can have to redo that code over and over again inside the Potentially. Okay, Right. So this is the, the heart of the search and sorted 1D array function. Here, you have all this code, um, the, the complex code for searching a 1D array. And then we have a separate VIM in here that is doing the scalar comparison. So we're trying to walk along and find the right function. And we're, we're, we're trying to find this element, and we look through it. Well. Instead of trying to put all that code at the same level, by saying this is the code that works on the array part, and the sub-VI is the part that works on the scalar part, we actually we can, we can get rid of a lot of the simplification. And I know what you're suggesting. I have not found it to be true in practice. The, the net result is you get a lot of savings, and, and frankly, you are bug-free um, if, if you say, I'm going to create a sub-VI around the next level down. So if you're taking an array, and then you're going to do something special on the internals of the array, and something on the internals of that if it's a cluster, and something on the special in that if it's an integer, each of those make that a, each, each one of those a nested VIM. And you can get, you, first of all, you'll be sane about getting the logic right. Uh, if you try to put all of that at the same block diagram, you'll be violating Dimitri's single responsibility principle. I know it's not Dimitri's, but <laughs> um, And uh, you'll, you'll, you'll be, you know, really struggling to keep all the code correct. Um, is there a VIM or is it just a multiple structures in the same database? I believe there is. Uh, it was written. I'm not actually sure. I didn't actually check off that it got in. It was That was someone else's verification. You, you, you mentioned that having the two, the two type cases is not recommended. Is, is there a use case, and I don't know if there is or isn't, is there a use case where you have two different inputs that would each have their own of these type cases before going into a sub-VI? Yes. If they're completely independent, yes, that is, that is definitely a use case. But when we're trying to do it on the, you know, flowing to each other, I guess that's probably a better way to phrase it, is connected pieces, dependencies on them. So that, thank you. That's actually probably, a, I, I probably should adjust my phrasing on that. Um, his question was, would you have two uh, type st structures on the same block diagram if they had completely independent inputs? And yes, then that, that would be. So one of them is adjusting the first input, one of them is adjusting the second. They're not dependent on each other and trying to reconstitute. So what I want to highlight here, and what I want you guys to play with, look at, and possibly be excited about, we have had a search 1D array for generations of LabVIEW. And that search 1D array does not work if you want to search for, say, something that matches the second element of your cluster. Or search 1D array with a different, say, case insensitive search on a string. <laughs> no, you have to go write your own search. This input here is the equals function. And you can wire in either a VI ref num 
or a functor class, either one, and this code will work. <coughs> and now, now we have a search Wendy array that you can provide, how would you like me to match these elements? And we've even taught it a little trick. We look inside, we can say, all right, does the class have an equals method? If the class has a method named equals that has this contain, we'll just use that. And if, if, if it doesn't, well then maybe we check and see, we do a type of cert on that, that equal search, and if you didn't wire it and it's just a default, we're just going to use the regular equals primitive. But if you did wire it and you gave us a functor object, we'll call it the functor object method. And if you didn't give us that, maybe you gave us a bi ref num to make a call by reference node. And that's your equals definition. And now you've got one node, and you can just specify how would you like me to look for equals? Uh, <laughs> this is on my bucket list for LabVIEW. I have a list of the things I found on my first day of work of things we need to fix in LabVIEW. This is on it. I am so excited about this. Do you have the search version of that too? Or oh, sorry, the sort version Yes, of that we too? do. <laughs> <laughs> we have got sort one d array, insert into sorted. We've got search uh, sorted on the array for things that are already sorted doing the high speed binary sort. I've got a whole bunch of algorithms and they're all in this shipping example. They're not in, these are not in the palettes, these aren't even in VI Live at the moment because they might need to get improved and tweaked and all, but this is where we're going. And I put these in here specifically because I figure a whole lot of people are going to be piling on writing uh, array type algorithms and manipulation algorithms and container algorithms and I would rather get those as bug reports rather than have a new library spin up because I really would like to ship these with LabVIEW. Um, so hopefully if you guys can take a look at the code and do a massive code review for me, um, we can make sure these are as polished as they possibly can be and we can all stop writing them. So his question is, what is the level of validation required to include things as shipping BIs? Um, Darren and I both put a, uh, it, it, when I say Darren and I, he and I set the standard for a lot of the BIs that go into BI Live. So it, it, there's lots of other people who do this sort of thing as well. Um, but he and my work and his work, we tend to validate off each other. And we establish for ourselves and then kind of push this as policy for BI Live itself. We first of all, we need to have a more complete test suite than maybe we've written initially. Um, we need to have looked at it on RT and a PGA, and if, even if it's not going to necessarily be jitter free, we have to know whether it is or not to be able to answer that question. So we have to have gotten some amount of qualification on it. Um, we want to have tested it enough that we know any special cases it's got, um, and we want to know that we think it is something we want to support for the long term. If we're unsure about the connector pane, or we don't know that this is named quite right, um, we'll tend to put it in and not put it in the pallets. And that gives us an opportunity to say, yeah, if we're going to ship a brand new BI that's going to go in the pallets, we can just leave the old one there for anybody who's found it and is using it. <coughs> but it gives us an out before it becomes a formal part of the documentation and, the most, and most people find it and use it. <coughs> Two questions. One is, where is this? Under examples, or is this yes. under BI Live? This is, uh, this is under examples. Okay. And the second you use a, 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 a phrase I've heard in math, but I've not in math, you tell me what a function is. Ah, yes. Uh, so that is a, an entire one hour lecture. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, and we're lucky if I can get it into that amount of time. Essentially, a functor is a class whose sole job is to behave like an operation of some other piece of data. Okay. And in this particular case, it's an object that defines an equals behavior or a less than behavior. Um, and what it allows is you to package the function with some amount of parameterization. So uh, I have one on the other side here. Uh, do, uh, There we go. Uh, this is my equals with epsilon for looking, for I want to search a one sure. array and find it within that tolerance. Sure. So it allows me to package a tolerance with the function. Um, and, and where, where, where is 
I wanted to look at that, where would I find it? That's in the shipping examples. That's, that's part of this particular shipping okay. example. Is, is the base functor.lv class part of VILib or examples? There is no base functor, functor class. Uh, this takes advantage of the malleable ability to substitute in any any method that has a matching name. So uh, we can we, we we don't have to have that common inheritance root. Do you have do you have documentation on the malleable VI saying if you wire a class here, I'm looking for this and this? Yeah, somewhere in that mess of comments. <laughs> <laughs> with with the connector pane that looks like this? I think so. Okay. Um, again, that's part of that standard. So. I think I've documented this sufficiently, but part of the standard for putting an API live is that a lot of other people have read the documentation. So, are we get, I think we're getting close on time. Now we still have a few minutes. I have uh, two questions. Uh, I just wanted to clarify. So, are, are valuable APIs recommended for live view real time? Yes, I mean, they, they work. If you write a, a, a malleable API in real time, and the VI that you write is jitter free, it's a compile time decision entirely. There is none of this that happens at, at runtime. It, you wire the types up, the compiler compiles for that data type. So they, they don't introduce anything new to the real time. You're still responsible for writing the code that is you know, real time safe code um, or works on real time targets, but it doesn't, they, 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 the VIM itself doesn't change anything. Sure. So if I have an instance like, you know, where I build the application, But then it does what? But then so it what? Like application, you know, I use malleable VIs on, I deployed it to the target, but then they load it up on the target. That's an unusual thing. Um, if that's true, we would like to know about it. Okay. And then the second question was more like maybe in the future, like the possibility of malleable class properties so that I could have a class that wraps something like a queue, and I hide the behavior that it's a queue underneath the hood, but then I want that queue operation. Yes. I mentioned I had a bucket list, right? <laughs> That's the request for malleable classes, uh, where the class private data is itself malleable and can substitute in types into the private fields, and we instantiate an entire class based on the wired types. Yes, that is very much a desired feature. I have no idea how long it will take to get there, but research is in progress. Okay. Uh, when you use the flexible class switching with the same VI name, uh, how strict is the adaptation? Right, so class adaptation, which is what I what, what we call it in the documentation, so you all got common terminology. When Malibu API does the class adaptation, the content has to be the same pattern. Any use terminals have to be the same direction. And the class terminal has to be in the same positions. So that's the that's really the, the three rules. But the exact types can be variant. Uh, they don't have to match uh, dynamic dispatch or static dispatch. That could be either one. They have to match the, the general uh, use pattern. So the, the layout of the terminals, which ones are used. Oh, and anything that's required has to be required in both. I guess that was probably a bug that we got fixed. I remember fixing that one. Yeah. Um, I say that's why part of why it wasn't released was so we can find those things. Uh, I see one back there. Uh, how's it getting big arrays for VIMs? What? Or big array, big data? So we just pack on time. They're VIMs. at the end of the day, they're just VIs. Um, they compile exactly like VIs. So the only magic of VIMs is entirely at compile time. So if it would work as a VI, the behavior is the same in the VIM. So there's there's no there's no change to any of the data type behaviors. So whether we're talking real time, how does it handle large data, any of those questions, that's all it all compiles down to being just the same as the back end of a VI. And so your answer is then the same as VI. Does it work in test time? Do they what do you mean work? <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> Oh no! If you try to call it, you, 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 if you try to call it directly to a VIM from test end, you have to give it exactly the types. There's no calling environment for it to learn a different type. So um, that's a that's a that, that would be a runtime behavior. Um, test end it makes runtime calls. It doesn't it doesn't do a compile environment. So um, we, we, 
say I can't do this, or is just yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, we'd give you the same error as if you tried to call a regular VI and give it the wrong data type. This is work for VI server types, so a uh, multi column list box versus a single column list box. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you can write, to the degree that we have made all the nodes polymorphic, you can write common code for those sorts of things. But you uh, the multi column list box, the single column list box, all of the repnum types, it's makes the same decisions and tries to, you know, the property nodes try to adjust the properties and that sort of thing. So, you yes, you can do a certain amount of that. Uh, there's a few places where I'd like to see that strengthened, and uh, property, uh, so, yeah, property nodes specifically don't work inside inline VIs. That's a separate issue that's been with LabVIEW for a long time, and as a result, you can't quite bring those things together. But if you take them and hide them inside sub-VIs, you can, you can get that to match up. So there's still some games that you're going to have to play until we can get that bug resolved. Um, I say bug, I think of it that way. It is a properly named and missing feature. So. All right. Um, I hope this is useful. I hope this is useful to you in the future. Thank you.